Hi, this is Sarah from Northern Impressions by Sarah, and I um, have my budgies who are making a lot of noise behind me, but I have a lapel microphone on, and I'm hoping that you can hear me and not hear the birds too much. So today, I don't really know what to do. I just um, thought maybe I could create my very first YouTube video and some of my friends could tell me what kinds of things they would like featured. Some would like tutorials. So I am just going to talk about watercolor. I've been painting for about five years off and on and I love it and I paint mostly really detailed work because that's what I like. Um, but today I thought I would show you some of the things that I got out in the bush I was foraging. So here's chanterelles. Um, now the camera doesn't want to focus very well here. Um, but uh, I think it focuses better when they're down here. I don't know if you can see the way the um, kind of grooves are. They're gills but they travel along um, the stalk and they don't, they fork and they aren't like your typical gilled mushroom. So that's one of the identifying features. And then here's some little leaves I got and blueberries. The blueberries are still really tasty out in the bush in northwestern Ontario, especially in the shade. And then at the grocery store I saw these cute little uh, pumpkin gourds and I couldn't uh, resist them. So I put them on my table and here's my fall fall stuff. It's, it's exciting. It's always fun when the weather changes and we get new things to enjoy. These uh, chanterelles can be picked during the summer and so can the blueberries but um, they last a long time into the fall and uh, they can even be picked after it snows. Um, so they're relatively hardy and long-lived fungi. So today I just threw a bunch of paints down on my palette and here we have Scarlet Pyrrole from M. Graham. Here, let's see, there. And here we have Transparent Orange from Windsor and Newton. I threw a little bit of this uh, Chinese orange from Sennelier in just for good measure. I don't usually use it because it has so many different pigments in it. I like, I prefer single pigments so that I can mix and I don't get muddy colors. This is Indian yellow from M. Graham and it's one of my most favorite colors in the whole world. It's just gorgeous. And then Hansa yellow deep is a kind of a medium yellow to add to, to that or to use in conjunction. This is quinacridone rust, and quinacridone rust is right here on my palette. Um, again, transparent, beautiful, uh, single pigment PO48. And here is perylene green. That's right here on my palette. And then just for a little bit of interest sake, I've got the Windsor green here in the middle. Um, so it's Windsor Green Yellow Shade. So I thought we could use these colors to paint some sketches of the gourds and the blueberries and the chanterelles. This is a little bit ambitious, but I can maybe fast forward some of it if it takes a while. Now this blue here is PV72 from Roman, Roman Schmall. That's a mouthful, but he's a wonderful paint maker from Poland. And it's a cobalt blue deep. This is uh, indigo, which is one of my favorite colors from Windsor Newton. And here's a shadow violet that I created. So these colors we'll just play with and see what we can do today. Um, I just did some little sketches here using a pit graphite um, stick pencil. It's 3B. There's no wood around it. It's just pure graphite. And then I used a little eraser. Now I don't usually recommend 
uh, drawing on your watercolor paper because erasing and stuff is hard on it. And I also don't like the graphite mixing with the watercolor, but today I thought I'd just do some really quick sketches, nothing too detailed, and we could see how it goes. I'm just going to pause this right now and check my sound and I'll be back. Welcome back. I think we're going to be fine with the sound. I just gave it a check. Now, obviously my perspective of these objects on my table is very different than yours because you're looking straight down on them. Um, but I just um, kind of sketched a couple. These few, I had them arranged differently, these chanterelles and the few blueberries here uh, beside them and some leaves. Then here I had the pumpkins um, kind of in a row with a flower in front of them. So I guess maybe we'll start on the pumpkin really fast here. And I, you can't see it's off the screen, but I have three jars of water. One that um, they're like spaghetti jars or ball quart jars, glass jars. And uh, I just recycle stuff that I have. This is a... Um, pipette that's of plastic and I use my clean water my third jar just just for clean water and then I drop in on my paints um, just a little clean water um, in order to create the mixtures uh, so that you know obviously you can't use watercolor just straight from the tube and the other two jars um, I have one that I use for the most dirty and then I use the other one for a second rinse. So I'm just going to um, pick up a little bit of this really brilliant Scarlet Pyro. It's way too bright, but uh, we'll just give it a, a light wash first in this. And then we can layer some other colors on top. So... The beauty of watercolor is that you can layer a lot of different colors, but in order for glazing or layering to work, it's best to use really transparent um, and usually single pigment colors uh, for that. And then the uh, when it's transparent, then you get to see the glow of the other color underneath. So that's what makes glazing so beautiful. One of my favorite brands of um, brushes is a Princeton Velvet Touch Long Round. I really like the long pointy tip for detail work. So I'm gonna use that brush here. Yeah, so earlier today we went up a local bush road and uh, got some mushrooms and blueberries and my son's learning to drive so he was practicing. So that was a nice thing to do on a gray cloudy fall day. So um, you'll notice that my palette is nothing special. It's a sushi plate, which I get at thrift stores. And uh, so most of the things that I use are recycled or repurposed because, you know, that wasn't made as a palette, but it works beautifully. Any white uh, glass is excellent as a watercolor palette. For mixing colors and so on, you get a really um, a good way to look at your color because if your underlying color that you're putting your paints on is not white, then you don't have an accurate perspective on the color. So now that I put oh the um, microphone fell off, I apologize. That must have been loud. Let's hope that works. All right, so. Now that the orange wash is on here, we're gonna put this aside so it can dry. And we'll pick up the, uh, again, boy, I'm having, 
problems. There. Maybe that'll stay now. Okay, I'm picking up the chanterelles and the blueberries. I'm going to start at the top because if you start at the top, it's easier not to smudge. Um, so here I am going over into my Indian yellow. So oh, the way that I'm looking at the perspective of the mushroom is kind of from the bottom up. So I'm not really seeing the top, I'm just seeing the bottom and the stem. And when you're working with watercolor, you want to kind of keep your brush moving. Otherwise you end up with hard edges, which is not ideal. Play with pencil or graphite. Once you run water and paint over that, it never comes off. So you kind of need to be happy with your pencil or else erase it before you paint because it will show through but a lot of people don't mind seeing the drawing that you started from and I know my drawing is all off the not a very centered composition but that's what happens when I just draw without a real plan <laughs> you know this is a sketch this does not have to be perfect and it certainly is not and right now what i'm doing is rinsing my brush dabbing it on a clean paper towel to remove excess because i realize that my color is is too intense and we all know or most of us know that our watercolor dries lighter um, than it is when it's wet. But I know from my experience with my colors that this is gonna dry too, too um, dark. So I'm removing a little going up the stem because the stem is a bit lighter than the cap. Oh, a damp brush almost dry can be used to lift paint before it completely dries usually it works best that way although you sometimes can lift paint when it's been dried completely but it's a little bit more difficult like that So now this stalk at the bottom, I've got some little uh, bits of moss growing around it. And usually I cut the stem off so that the roots of the mushroom stay in the ground. But sometimes that's hard when it's really far down in the moss and I didn't have a very good knife today. So that's why the root pulled up. Normally you don't you don't want to do what I just did. But I also thought it's kind of cool just for showing what it looks like on the bottom. Um, so now I'm going to find a little bit of black to mix. This is lunar black that I'm picking up from another palette that's off 
camera and I'm just gonna mix some Quin Rust with that and it makes a really dark brown. And so here I can just kind of draw some of these kind of rooty type bits. Um, and then also the edge tends to get dry so I am, and it darkens as it dries. So I'm just touching that up. All right, that kind of represents the roots. Now, over here, I've got a bit of a piece of moss. It looks feathery and light and kind of fun. And they do grow in moss, um, often reindeer lichen, but then also other moss. So now we've got that. And now I'm going to just put a light layer of this green, just kind of a minty green, on a, a few of these blueberry leaves. This one is more of a red, so I'm going to have to find a maroon or something to add to that. And I have a little palette here that I use for when I go away and I um, have in the lid a uh, bit of a key so that I know what colors are what. And this permanent alizarin crimson here is pretty much like the color of that blueberry leaf. It's good to have some kind of a key with your paints because when the paint dries, it's often hard to tell what the color is. Um, it's difficult to tell for sure when with watercolor because as it dries, it really can get dark. And now with the blueberries, I think that our, our cobalt blue deep from Roman Schmal would be a good um, a good approximate color to start with. And you can see it goes a bit milky when you mix some water with it. Um, that's just that pigment. And so right away when I touch it, I feel like that's too dark. So I just kind of rub my palette to get some of the paint off and then I dab Rinse and dab on my paper towel. So usually when you do a sketch for watercolor, it should be pretty light colored so that you don't really see uh, the marks too much. But that's a matter of preference. Some people like to use pen and ink as well. So um, this color, when you add enough water to it, is slightly granulating, meaning it, it has a bit of texture. So that's kind of cool because blueberries have texture, don't they? And then here I'm just going to try to pick up a little bit of indigo and drop that in some of the shadow areas. Because everything's wet, it will run together. So if you don't want the paints to run together, you wait till it's all dry. I think that when you're doing a sketch, it's often nice to let it run together a little. And there we have it. That is um, the first coat on the blueberries and the chanterelles. Right, now we'll go back to our little pumpkin gourd because they're pretty much dry. And I'm going to go here to my perylene green because when I look at these gourds, um, the green is really dark on the stem. And perylene green is, is a, it's actually a black pigment 
called PBK31 in this case from Windsor Newton. And, uh, but it's green leaning. So it's a very useful color. And if you feel that, you know, your initial wash is too dark again, you can go in and lighten it. And the tip of the stem is really light because it's broken off. If it's too light, go back and pick up some darker paint. Okay, and now my first stem is quite dark. And so I'm just taking my brush, my dampish brush, and running it over to pick up a little bit of that paint. So we've made a stab at the start of these stems. Now over here I have buff titanium, which is a white pigment that's kind of tan call it buff. And uh, I'm just going to touch that here to the tops of these stems. And because the paint was wet, it sort of mixed together there with the green. So I just went back and I dabbed some thick, pure buff on top. And every time I rinse my brush, I dry it on a little piece of shop paper towel. And this stuff will last for a long time. And, you know, you can use one piece for quite a while and it's very helpful because controlling the amount of water on your brush is key with watercolor. Now I have this little bachelor's button that I had laying in front of the pumpkins. So I'm going to attempt to paint it and uh, I'm going to try to find a color here in my little kit that will be approximately what I want. And I think the smaltz blue from Windsor Newton is about right. This is Pigment Violet 15. Uh, so it's a it's a pretty light purple. And this is just you know quick sketch guys, nothing too stressful. Now um it's interesting because the little flowerettes are shaped like a funnel, kind of. And I sort of feel like I want a little bit darker blue in the middle. So I'm just kind of dabbing a little in there. Now I think I painted my stem. That's supposed to be green. I painted it blue and purple. That's okay. So I just wet it and remove some of that paint. Now I'll go over here, pick up a little bit of green, tap that in there, make a stem, a little bud. Great. Now, when we look at our gourds, they reflect the light and they're not all bright orange. So what I would like to do is remove a bit of paint where the ridges are. So to do that, I'm taking a damp brush and I'm running it over the spot that I want to lighten. And then I'm going to pick up a bristle brush and very gently give it a rub. Just a quick little rub to loosen the pigment on those ridges. And I'm going to use a piece of my shop towel. 
and remove a little bit of paint. It didn't lighten it much, but just a little. You can see, now you can see the ridges a little bit. So, going to do the same thing here. So I'm wetting it and giving it a little rub. And I'm tapping it with the paper towel. Because things aren't just one color. There are lots, lots of colors, lots of shades, lots of different values. Now these pumpkins are a little damp, but the orange that they, they consist of is a lot of yellow too. So what I'm going to do is take a little bit of Indian yellow and go over the orange to try to make it approximate real life a little bit more. So oh, that's our second glaze of color on there. And Second pumpkin with a bit of yellow, Indian yellow that is. Sketches should just be fun, quick kind of things. And uh, now for the dark little um, areas where the deeper parts of the ridges, I'm going to take a little bit of this um, Sinelli Chinese orange and just run that along my pencil line. And if I forgot to, to draw them in, then I am just gonna draw them in with the paint. So these pumpkins here have three colors. The first was the scarlet pyrrole, the second was um, the Indian yellow, and the third was the Sennelier Chinese orange, and then of course the stems are other colors, but that's sort of another topic. Don't forget to watch the curve of these uh, patterns as you paint try to copy what what you see not what you think ought to be there because that's usually our difficulty with painting is that we want to paint what we think we see not what we actually see it's still something I struggle with now we should make some shadow and we can use purple or blue or a combination. And we could mix in some uh, black or a dark brown. So I'm 
and you just kind of try to get the parts where, where the lights. So the light is coming from this direction, more or less, in my little vignette. Um, so when you, you paint something, you always want to look where that light is coming from and where where the shadows are the darkest. Violet makes good shadows on yellow. And orange is not far off, so violet can be a nice softer shadow. So you can do this kind of thing with anything around your house and you can see that my shadows just kind of bled because of course the paint was still wet and you can do the same thing take your damp brush run it along dab it off on some paper towel to remove some of the paint that you don't want to be there and we can come back and add a few more details after a bit so now we'll go back to our little sketch here of the, um, now my screen went on my laptop, so I'm just double checking, the chanterelles. So we have a nice glow on the chanterelles, and now we need to try to indicate those grooves to make it a little more, or gills, to make it a little more realistic. So, um... I was kind of leaning toward this um, Chinese orange, but <clears throat> I'm not quite sure if that's the right color. So what I've done now, you can see that I just mixed some paint and some water to get about the right consistency. And here is a Simply Simmons liner um, in 10 over 1, so it's a very small tipped paintbrush. And I really like this if I need to do long lines. Sometimes this type of brush was called a rigger. And the reason for that was they used it to make the rope lines on ships, the rigging of ships. So this doesn't have to be exact, but you just want to give the idea of these gills and the gills kind of fork and fork again. They are not simply straight lines. And uh, they don't need to be very dark. Well, we do need to see them because they're kind of an important part of this fungus, fungi. They come down the stalk a bit. <clears throat> curve a lot, so they're very, they're not straight lines. So sometimes you get a line that's quite dark, unintentionally, because you put too much paint on. You can dab your line a little bit with a damp paper towel to remove a bit, and then and we'll start over. Again, dabbing your brush on a paper towel so it's not too fully loaded helps. Uh, 
I apologize for my burps. I'm not sure if you can hear them, but. So you can feel free to twist your paper so that you can paint. So the brushes I use are not very expensive, not like a lot of people prefer some, you know, like sable or other material. Um, but for me, I like these synthetic brushes. And I like to keep things. I, I like to have very good paints because that's super important. But as far as the brushes go, I prefer the snap or the springiness of synthetic over sable as a animal hair. And um, it's a little more soft and when you paint sometimes it doesn't spring back very well so that's not my favorite thing and so outlining things can seem a bit cartoonish but sometimes it helps give three dimension you know a bit of dimensionality to your work so sometimes I like to add a bit of color to the edges. Going back to this brush, so <clears throat> sometimes the lines get too harsh, so you can just rub a damp brush over them to soften them. So the next step probably would be to add a bit of shadow to these forks to make them seem a little bit more three-dimensional and um, I'll go back to the liner for that and I'll probably go for quinacridone rust which is even a little darker tapping the tip of my brush on my paper towel to remove some of the paint and um, now I'm going to fill in some of these you know, forked areas. And if your shadow is not shadowy enough, you can go back and get a bit stronger of a paint mixture. Just rub your brush along to might tap it with a paper towel if you feel it got too dark. Rub your brush to soften some edges. <clears throat> So I don't really think I did an awesome job there, but this is a sketch. So by doing this kind of work, what you're doing is training your eye to see, helping you see what is actually in front of you rather than the guessing that we do. There's a lot of thought that we have these symbols of ideas of what things look like in our minds and a lot of the time we want to paint that rather than what's actually there.
And I often get the feeling that I'm doing that. I start painting. I go, well, am I really looking at what I'm doing? Probably not. I'm just sort of guessing. So we all do it. And, you know, shadows are are difficult because you want them dark enough, but not too dark. And um, it's, it's often hard to decide what color to use for shadows. And each color is different. Now, the complement for um, this yellow would be a violet, probably, or purple. But, you know, sometimes... You don't really know what that's going to look like, and so you're scared to add it. But here I've just picked some up, and uh, you can, you know, just add a touch and see what you think and see if that's the right shadow color. And that's what sketches are about. They're, you know, you haven't spent all the time on a big painting. You're just getting an idea of um, what colors might work and what brushes, what angle, what composition, you know. So it's all a learning process and not something to be too, I guess, precious about. And I think sometimes we don't paint because we're worried that it's not going to look beautiful or won't be good enough or, or something like that. But I think that probably most of us need some kind of a creative outlet. And we should do that without being too worried about perfection and so... Anyhow, and then you could use a little bit of the violet, you know, in the roots, even the moss. So I'm going to take some of my green and mix it with some of my brown to get more of an earthy color to mix in my moss, my little pieces of moss. And while it's still wet, we can pick up a bit of yellow, throw that in there because the moss that I showed you, which I might not have showed you, it, it looks a yellowy green to me. Very, there, I'm going to put it on the, on the card with the paint. So I think that I've made my depiction too, too dark. It's more of a really light yellow, green. And mix a little yellow and a little green and, you know, splash that in there. But there's a bit of a uh, rusty brown mixed in. There's a root there. So have fun. Just play. Then I'm going to go into these leaves and darken them a little. <clears throat> green is usually not just green. I mean, green objects have reflections and imperfections, and so. And add some quin rust because these are fall colored leaves and they have speckles of rust on the edges and they have dots of uh, yellow in them but right now this is too wet and so every time I try to do anything to it, it just all goes together so I'm gonna just go back put some green on there and wait for that to dry here I'm going to put some rust on this blueberry leaf. 
And here I'm going to go back to this, uh, this leaf here. You can see there's a lot of a rusty color as it's aging and getting, you know, it fell off the plant, obviously. So I just dab that in. Then I'm going to get some Indian yellow and dab that in. And just sort of let the colors mix on the page. And on this light green leaf, we've got dark edges and splotches. And so I'm just going to add a little bit more green and kind of let that all mix. And I'll make another leaf here. So I'm making a bit of a mess, but you know, you're playing right now. You're just seeing what you like and how you might like to arrange things. Okay. So those things have to dry before I try adding anything else to them. And I think that the mushrooms are mostly done, except I would like a little to show a little bit of the rim. I don't think you can see this, but there's a bit of a light rim around the top from my perspective. And I'm going to make some dilute Indian yellow and kind of put a light bit there without trying to get my hand in the other paint. And I'm going to go pick up a little bit of lemon yellow and just touch that to that rim that's light and bright. And then I might, you know, dab a little bit of this lemon yellow into the stems. Oops, I got some green in my brush. But that's okay because things do pick up reflections from what's around them. And there we have pretty much finished those chanterelles there. Now for the blueberries, I'd like to layer in a bit of purple or violet because it's it's there. You might not always see it, but I kind of outlined it. Now I have a damp brush and I'm using that to kind of blend those uh, colors a little with what's there already. And then the fruiting or the, the flowering end is really dark and I'm going to go get some indigo and touch that. It looks like a five pointed star but when you're looking at it at an angle and it's not so much. And sometimes the star is sort of inverted on itself. And sometimes it's really sticking out. Like all five points of the star are sticking out. Um, so each berry is a little bit different. And usually inside the uh, dark is a bit of violet. And so, you know, dropping that in right now just kind of made a mess. But you can go pick up a little bit from areas that are too dark. Sort of blend things in. 
And now in the shadows, I'm going to add a little more indigo. That's my favorite version of indigo from Windsor and Newton. And you can brush the edges of your shadows with a little water and let them kind of bleed out. Um, and build in a little bit of shadow for your mushrooms. And So we're getting there. I mean, it's a sketch, right? Add a little bit of Indian yellow to those green leaves. Make them a little bit more realistic. Maybe a bit more quinacridone rust. Throw some other shadow colors in if it makes you feel happy. Do whatever you like. It's your sketch.
to add a little violet to my my mushroom shadows. And if you really want to, you can <clears throat> make a complete background color. really talk about paper but paper is probably the most important part of watercolor painting. It really needs to be 100% cotton but you can buy the really big sheets that are 22 by 30 inch and cut them up into little pieces and then they don't cost very much. Um, so that's my tip is to buy the big pieces, cut them up and then you have more reasonably priced work surface. Um, I just find that there's probably little point in learning to paint in watercolor if you don't have cotton to work with. You'll be really frustrated. Um, but if you don't, and that's that's okay. I mean, that's everybody has to start with what they have. Then you can um, just start with what you have. That's probably a lot more important. Because if we don't start, then we never get anywhere. So start with what you have. And then if you're local to me, I can sell you a little bit of paper for sure. Um, we don't have much in the way of local stores. So I purchase everything online. And if I'm working on a big painting, then I tape my watercolor paper down. But when I'm just doing a little sketch, I like having the paper just in my hand where I can move it around. Nice to leave a little bit of a highlight of white around some of your air, uh, subject if you can. And I don't really feel like going into a great deal of detail on that little flower. So it's your sketch. You do what you want. And, uh, whatever makes you happy. I'm just going to put a few splotches of darker color in there. And there. So we have two sketches and I'm going to try to give you the line art so that you can just kind of follow along. So a photo of the composition and then a photo of the line so that you can print that and trace it if you like because um, sometimes you just want to paint and not necessarily spend a lot of effort on drawing. So I hope that um, you had fun and uh, my laptop timed out there so I couldn't tell what was happening. Um, so, you know, and let me know what you're interested in doing. And uh, if you need any supplies in your local, we can do something so that you don't have to buy 10 or more you know, tubes of color.
Um, but anyhow, so you can see that a lot of my favorite colors have honey in them. Those are the Enneagram colors because they re wet so easily. And I'll do more details on colors another time if you like. Take care. Thanks for spending time with me. I appreciate it. Bye-bye.